Good morning. My name is Ashley Muir. Welcome to Hybrid Worship at Faith United Church in Curtis, Ontario. If this is your first time visiting us, either online or in person, we are delighted that you are joining us. The order of service will appear here on the screen, as it will too on YouTube. For those online, a downloadable copy is available on our website, faithunited.ca, by clicking on the Sunday Bulletin. Whether you are here or online, we invite you to use whatever social media you wish to let others know that you are worshiping at Faith today by checking into Faith on Facebook, sharing our Facebook page, or um, a po posting a thought on the sermon today. If you are watching live this morning, we encourage you to sign into YouTube and chat with each other. This week's consideration question is, how does God speak to you? Friends, whether we are together or apart, Faith United is a welcoming community of faith. We are doing so by providing a scent-free place, an accessible place of worship in person. We are an affirming congregation, meaning that we are public, intentional, and explicit about our welcome and inclusion of persons who identify as LGBTQ2S+. We strive to honor and respect all people. We also recognize that the land where we live and worship has a rich history. Over the centuries, this land has been shared at various times by many people, and we recognize this by saying our land acknowledgement together, which appears on the screen and in the bulletin. As an act of respect and reconciliation, we at Faith United acknowledge that our church is on the unceded land of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. We are treaty people living in the treaty the Williams Treaty. We have some birthdays this week. Coming up are Jocelyn Doyle, Larry Bignall, Alex Sankey, Lincoln Mercer, who turns 10 this week, and two birthdays that are today are Eleanor Gray and Lisa Lazarin. Happy birthday to everyone. If there is anyone in the congregation or online that's celebrating a birthday this week, happy birthday to you as well. For those online, if you happen to have a candle at home or wherever you are, I hope you will turn, I hope you will light it as I turn to light the Christ candle in a moment. Now let's take a moment to pause, take a deep breath, and feel grounded as we prepare ourselves for worship. God is in this place. Help me know this. Hallelujah, it is the season of Easter. We come to celebrate our new life in Christ. We come to experience the opening of our eyes and minds. 
we come to worship with burning hearts. Hallelujah. Shalom is an ancient word of faith. It means peace and wholeness and wellness and blessing and flourishing. If you're online, I hope you'll take out your devices and send shalom into the world. If you're here in the sanctuary, I hope you'll turn and make eye contact and a big smile and bless one another with shalom. actually a song by a group called Rend Collective, and that is in the upcoming new hymn book for the United Church. That's one of the ones that's included, called My Lighthouse. 
Well, you've just had a preview. Prayer of Invocation and Transformations in the bulletin up on the screens. I remind you there's a time for your own prayerfulness in the midst of this. Let's pray. Still basking in the glow of Easter, we gather to open ourselves ever more fully to your transforming spirit, O oh God. We pray that you will meet us on the roads we travel, overwhelm our senses, with your presence and nudge us to seek renewal of our purpose and our passion. May the risen Christ rise within us and draw us ever deeper in faith. Standing in your light, hearts broken open, acknowledging our humanness, seeking transformation, savoring your holy presence, we pray. God hears, forgives, makes whole, renews, and loves. Breathe deeply of God's shalom and be God's. Amen. There I am. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> so I have either a bad cold or the end of bronchitis, so please excuse my coughing. I'm happy I'm still able to sing more or less, so that's okay. <coughs> Sometimes I may stop. And I have lots of fishermen's friends, so they are my friend. So kids, are there other kids? Who, if you want to come up, you want to come up? I'm sorry, I didn't invite you up. Come on up. And if there's, if there's not chairs, the floor is great too. Yeah. You're welcome to come sit on the floor. That's great. Sorry about that. I saw kids here and I said, oh, good look. The kids are all here. Hi there. So here's my question. How do you know if you're supposed to do something? How do you know? People tell you to. What kind of people tell you to do things? Who tells you to do things? Who? Teacher. A teacher will tell you to do things at school. Yeah. Who tells you to do things? Your mom. He goes like this. My mom. Your family. That's a good one. Who else? Who else tells you? Me? No, I don't really tell you to do I, I hope you'll do things. Oh, you mean yourself? Oh, I understand. Yes, you tell yourself to do things. Right, to give yourself a, a nudge. Yeah. A babysitter, if they're the ones responsible for you, that's a good one. So someone tells you to do it, that, that's good. Do you always do what you're told to do? You're in church, you gotta be honest. I'm just stepping back in case lightning strikes, that's all. Sorry. Yeah. So sometimes we do, sometimes what usually we do, right? What if it was something really hard or really scary, but the person who told you to do it loves you and you knew that they, they meant for the best for you, so they're not going to send you to do something terrible, but maybe it might be scary, maybe you've never done it before, or maybe you're, you're a little afraid of doing it. How do you feel? Are you going to do it? Maybe, right. 
Do you think you might argue about it? Might say, what, you want me to do that? No, I don't want to do that. And they say, I really think you should. And then maybe they'll tell you why. Okay, so I have a little story for you. I used to be a teacher, a school teacher, before I did this, right? And now I'm a minister, right? How did I know I was supposed to go from being a teacher to being a minister? It wasn't my mom who told me. It wasn't a teacher who told me. Well, it was a little bit of that. Some other people said, you know what, have you ever thought about being a minister? Some people did say that. And I went, <laughs> like that. Hmm? <coughs> me? Yeah, hey, I, it was part something in me. <laughs> yeah, that was part of it. And so when you're in kind of my job or things around church, we say that God tells us to do things, or God calls us to do things. So one day, I went to my mailbox, and I opened up my mailbox, and I went, oh, cool, a letter. And it said, dear Larry, go to minister school. Love God. <laughs> God sent me a letter. It was right there. You don't believe me? No, I'm making it up. I'm making it up. I wish God would send me a letter, because then I'd know exactly what God wanted me to do. But God usually doesn't do that. In the Bible, there's all sorts of stories with people who hear God's voice, where they might see an image of Jesus, and they get a message. I've never had anything that clear. I've never had a letter or a big image. I wish I would, because then it would be easy. Yes, Jesus, I see you. I'll do it. But do you know what? Most of the people, even in the Bible, even though they heard God's voice or see Jesus, do you know what the first thing they almost always say is? Not me. Not me. I don't want to. This is crazy. And then God says, and they go, okay. And they do it. And, and they kind of move into that space that's not very comfortable. Right? It was scary. It was scary for me to stop being a teacher and start being a minister. That was scary. But here we are. Yay! So, I have been here a hundred years, yes. <laughs> So God doesn't send letters, right? God, some people can, can feel like they hear God's voice. That's, that's good. Some people kind of sense God's presence. I like to use the, the word, the nudge. I feel God kind of nudge, nudges me. And God nudges and nudges and nudges and won't leave me alone until I feel, okay, God, I get it. I get it. I hear. Even though I'm not hearing, I kind of hear. Does that make sense? That's my story for you. And when you feel that nudge from God, the big hard thing is to say, here I am, I'm going to try it. Step out of my comfort zone and do it. So that's my message for you, that I, I doubt you'll ever get a letter from God. But I bet you'll get a nudge. I bet you get lots of nudges. I hmm, wonder what you'll do with them. Let's pray. I'll say words you say back. Dear God, dear God, thank you for your nudges. Thank you for your nudges. Help me notice, help me notice, and help me answer yes, and help me answer yes. Amen. All right, that's my kids' time for you. Here you go for the people to help you. Have a great day. Good morning. I won't touch it. The scripture reading this morning comes from Acts 9, verses 1 to 20, the conversion of Saul. <coughs> Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, 
whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and through his, though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street of, called Straight, Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision, and at the house of Judas, a man named Ananias came in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. As Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings. And before the people of Israel, I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and he was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus, Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.
Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our heart rise like sweet incense to you, O God. May we be challenged and convicted to keep Christ in our minds, Christ on our lips, and Christ in our hearts. Amen. God, or if you've turned your back on blessings, or if you're an atheist, or if you're a, a radical agnostic, or you know, if you're just plain really don't know what to make of this whole renewal life thing, then the Pharisee named Saul, who breathed threats and murder for those who belong to the way, he might be your model for resurrection, for a renewed life. Right? Someone who's really going in a different direction and gets totally turned. But that's not most of us, right? Most of us here are people of faith. Most of us online are people of faith. We're already followers of the way of Jesus in some capacity. We're the ones Saul was after at the beginning of the story. We're the insiders. For people like us, the compelling character in the story is actually a virtually unknown disciple named Ananias. So let's look at Ananias' story. This often gets called Paul on the road to Damascus, right? That's, the, that's how it gets billed. But for me, this is Ananias' story. It says that the Lord spoke to him in a vision and called his name, and his name happens to mean favored of the Lord. Ananias answers instantly, here I am, Lord. Would you? Would you answer like that? You hear God's voice? Here I am, Lord. I don't know. Have you ever heard your name called by God in a vision? I don't know. In Ananias' vision, the Lord tells him to get up and go down to Straight Street. Yeah, I know, their city planning department had no imagination whatsoever. And there you will find a guy named Adolf Hitler. I mean, it may, well, may as well have been Adolf Hitler for him. This guy, Saul, had orders to round up all the disciples of the way and toss them in jail, and eventually they'd likely be killed. So the Lord is saying to Ananias, hey, nice little disciple, go and be all spiritual with the most horrible guy there is. Go and be loving to someone who hates you. Because Adolf, I mean Saul, has had a dream that you are coming to pray with him. Okay, be honest. What would your reaction have been? You have a tea with Hitler. Say what? Are you serious? Everybody knows that dude's crazy and evil. He only wants to kill us all. I mean, that's, that's what I'd probably say. Only I probably wouldn't have been so polite about it. But Ananias, he did protest. He said, you know, not me. And do you know what the Lord replies to him? Don't argue. Go. He's the one I'm tapping to take this thing global. And now I'm about to show him, Saul, how hard this way is. To which Ananias probably said, oh man, I shouldn't have had that double pepperoni pizza last night. Oh, <laughs> clearly I've got wicked indigestion. But he goes, he goes. He finds Saul who, for three days was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Hmm, three days, dark, no eating or drinking. It's like he was dead and then on the third day had new life. Where have I heard that story before? So how does Ananias resurrect Paul? Saul, sorry. He prays with him and he lays hands on him. That's a practice we actually maintain to this day. We don't do it all the time in church. Um, if you were here for the baptism a couple weeks ago, right? we lay hands on in a baptism. Uh, when we used to have healing services here in the before times, before COVID, people would come forward, we would lay on hands and pray. Uh, if you were ever to attend a, an ordination or a commissioning at those things, there's laying on of hands and prayer. It's, it's a physical connection that augments and amplifies a spiritual connection. It's lovely. Laying on hands is a very spiritually powerful thing. 
Um, indeed, it says Saul was filled with the Spirit through this prayerful action. And then the story goes that Saul's eyes were opened, and he gets baptized, and then he stays a little while with the very same disciples he was coming to arrest. Think that through. And they knew he was coming to arrest them, and now he's going to hang out with them for a while. And with their help, he tries to make sense of this experience and gear up for this renewed life that he's going to have. So both Saul and Ananias would have what we would probably call today a mystical experience, right? Mystical. Mystical experiences don't have to include visions and voices, but in this case, they did. And the key to having a mystical experience, and I suspect many in the room probably have had one, many online have probably had one, the key is radical openness, radical openness. Now, the text doesn't say much about Ananias and his prayer life, but think this. It simply says he was a disciple from Damascus. Well, back in those days, there were not a lot of casual or cultural Christians, right? I mean, you were all in if you were a disciple back in those days. So the disciples had to be pretty serious about their faith life. Unlike Saul, though, Ananias doesn't appear to be all that shocked by this vision. I mean, sure, he's a little iffy about whether he should go through with it, Hitler and all. <coughs> Excuse me. But there's no shock. There's no shock or terror in his story. So from that, I get the sense that Ananias was a man of deep prayer. Right? And that, that visions or messages or nudges from God, from the Holy Spirit, were expected, desired, welcomed. Now, that's far different from Saul's experience here. Saul had the more dramatic mystical experience, the one we all know about, but he was not expecting it or desiring it or welcoming it. Okay, so he's pretty closed to the spirit. So if you have to be open to get a mystical experience, how come Saul got one, right? Because he was so closed. Well, frankly, he got knocked on his keister to open him up, that's how. It's a classic lightning bolt, wake up call, conversion to faith, right? We, we get these dramatic stories. I just wanna make sure that we can all see that Saul's wonderfully dramatic story isn't the only way that spirit moves. It doesn't have to be a lightning bolt, top of the mountain kind of thing. Ananias' story here is just as powerful in its own way. And I hope we can see that both of these in their own way are Easter stories, right? They're renewal stories, a new path. In the Easter season, we focus on the word resurrection. We focus on the empty tomb. Without Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we would not be in this place doing this stuff, right? And yet, this is not just a history class. This is not a, a theology lecture. This is a, a greenhouse for spiritual growth. Right? This place is a, a fitness center for spiritual exercises. It's a music room where we join our instruments with others to participate in holy music making. Yeah, we start with Jesus' story and we get drawn in by stories like Saul's and Ananias's. We live and breathe our own stories. It's not just history, it's now. And our collective story has faith united. Your life is an ongoing series of little and sometimes big death and resurrection episodes. You die to certain things and are reborn into renewed things all the time. It happens all the time. Now, when that happens, you don't become a brand new person with a new identity when you experience that renewal. You become a transformed version of your former way. Does that make sense? You bring your gifts and your skills and knowledge and passions along with you, but they are they're retuned and redirected and reoriented in a fashion that makes you more open to God and God's presence. And through that, that fills you with spiritual energy to then move into the world sharing that presence with everything you do. Now, Saul didn't 
change from being a scholar and a religious leader and a tireless, fiery champion of what he thought was right. He was still all those things. After his transformation, he was still all that, but just in a new direction. He took on a new name. He went from Saul to Paul, whose name we know much better, Paul. And that's a sign that he had changed. But Saul to Paul is a pretty subtle change. I mean, he didn't change his name to Wilbur or Barney or something. It was Saul to Paul. He's, he's still the same guy, but reborn, renewed. His passion was renewed. Faith United is going through a kind of death and resurrection this season, right? We are coming to the end of my tenure here. And then there will be a time of transition, and then there will be a new beginning. But faith won't stop being faith just because I exit stage left. Like Saul and Ananias, faith will bring all of what you are, your gifts, your skills, your knowledge, your passions with you as you go forward, but they'll be retuned, right? Restated, refocused in a fashion that opens you to God's new future. Our churches have tended to hold permanence and comfort as our highest values, which is really odd because every time you open your Bible and read a page or two, you are bombarded with stories of people who experienced tremendous change. And they were nudged significantly out of their comfort zones. If permanence and comfort are your goals, then church is probably not a good place for you. Because they are absolutely incompatible with this way that Jesus lived and taught. If you're a comfortable Christian, you're probably doing it wrong. Ananias was a good, faithful follower, and he was zapped and went into the presence of the enemy and prayed with him. That must have been pretty uncomfortable. Can you imagine? And imagine Saul walking into the same synagogues that he was going to for the purpose of arresting the followers of the way, and instead now standing up and saying, I'm one of them which meant now he is risking being arrested by the guy who took over his job. How's that for being outside of your comfort zone? Are you ready to be outside of your comfort zone? That's the question. At Faith United, we've been pretty comfortable together for a long while, and it's been good. But you're about to be moved out of your comfort zone when change comes like it or not. What ministries might God be nudging you to innovate with or embrace or get behind that might even give you butterflies in your stomach and make you say, God, are you serious? Yeah, God's serious. Just ask Saul and Ananias. How will you answer God's call in this season of renewal? It's important to note that Saul's conversion is not solely or primarily for his own self, right? It's just not the conversion of Paul, and yeah, look, now I'm, I'm different. He is called for a purpose, and that purpose is to share the gospel with the Gentiles. He was called for ministry. Often when we talk about mystical experiences or spirituality, we might get the sense that it's a very private almost a selfish thing, or at least a self-indulgent thing, right? Spirituality, prayer, is just for me. That a mystic is someone who's so heavenly-minded that they're no earthly good. But that's just not true. It's just not true. Like Saul, we are called for a purpose. Like Ananias, we are nudged into action. Yes, it's rooted in prayer. Ananias was at prayer. Paul prayed for three days but it doesn't stay there. Spirit doesn't sit. Spirit moves. Spirituality begins by looking inward for the purpose of moving outward in love. 
This is my hope for the church, for, for this church and for, for all churches. I hope that we can read stories like today's and see past the glitz and the glamour of the superstar conversion of Saul and be inspired by the real hero of the story, Ananias. Listen carefully. Saul could not have become Paul if Ananias had not been a man of deep prayer. My prayer is that we can all become like him, Ananias. People of deep prayer who are not surprised when the Spirit of God nudges us. Who after our initial response of, are you crazy? That we allow the Spirit to fill us and propel us out of our comfortable pews and into action. Remember, without that mystical prayer experience, Saul couldn't hear his true calling. And Ananias certainly never would have wandered into Saul's room on his own. A small group has started meeting on Friday afternoons here to pray for this season of transition at faith. Uh, there's a note about it in the bulletin. I hope you'll either join them or support them in prayer. That's how Ananias felt God's nudge. How will faith feel God's nudge in this time of visioning and searching? Prayer is a great foundation. Spirit renews our passions and blows us into motion, but the scriptures seem pretty consistent that the Spirit needs our attention and permission to do its thing. What would it be like if we all gave it? Gave that permission. What would it be like if every single person affiliated in any way with Faith United turned their attention to deep prayer and intentional opening of themselves to God's own? What would it be like if every member, adherent, or visitor to this church became a prayer-focused disciple like Ananias and created the optimal conditions for mystical awakenings within themselves? What might be dreamt? What might be discerned? What might be dared? If people allowed themselves to sense that spiritual nudge and let it fuel them up and launch them. What if every church did that? I think we'd see an unbelievable transformation, a resurrection of the church, an awesome army of people with renewed passion for life, renewed passion for ministry, renewed passion for loving God, loving people, loving one another. People out there might even wonder, what's going on in there? Because, because they look into the tombs that are too many churches and find that what was dead was reborn. They'd see a real story of Easter resurrection and a renewal. That's a vision. So, friends, whether you are Saul who needs a massive wake-up call, or whether you're an Ananias who needs to keep on praying in hope, or whether you're a Faith United person that is prayerfully pondering a transition. I pray that you will leave this place thinking about how you might create that precious, spacious openness within yourself so that the Spirit might stir and move in you and through you and renew your passion. Amen.
This is a uh, beautiful, lovely song about hearing God's voice. myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is it's okay the last thing I need is to be heard but to hear what you would say word of God speak Pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty. To be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God. Finding myself in the midst of you, beyond the quiet, beyond the noise, all that I need is to be with you in the quiet, to hear your voice, the word of God speak. You pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God, speak. Would you pour down like rain? Washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God, speak. Word of God, speak. God speak, would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place, please let me stay and rest in your holiness. God, we look around creation and try to drink in the diversity, the complexity, the harmony, the incredible beauty, 
the awesome power, the interconnectedness of all we see. And we simply cannot fathom what it all means. But as we stand in that confusion, that wonder, that awe, we are swept up by waves of peace and joy and thankfulness. Hallelujah. Remind us, oh God, that Easter is not just a day, it's a season. And it's not just a season, it's a worldview. <clears throat> Easter is your promise of new life for all who would seek it. Each day we rise up fresh, new, reborn, renewed. May we live this new day in your way, Abba. God, in this time and place when your people gather to pray, we lay our hearts open before you and we lift up to you our joys, our concerns, our thankfulness, and our cares. And in the silence of this holy moment, we pray for all that is on our hearts today. these things in the name of Jesus, the Christ, the risen one, who taught us to pray in this way. Our Father and Mother who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, it's time in the service where we talk about offering and how an offering is a response to God's love that fills us and needs expression in the world. And we always begin with that, that foundational importance of how all the ways that we interact with the world on our own is our offering of God's love. The ways you are kind and generous and thoughtful and friendly and helpful, that is your offering of God's love. We also talk about how a financial offering to the life and work and ministry of the church is so important, and uh, we hope that you will continue to make those offerings. If you're online and would like to make an offering, you can go to website, faithunited.ca, and find a donation button, or anyone could pull out their phone and open up their banking app and make an uh, e-transfer to donations at faithunited.ca. All sorts of ways to support the life and work and ministry of the church. And of course, there's the way that we share how we are faith united together and how this church is a unique expression of God's love. And here is Ashley. If you would like to come up and make an announcement, please, uh, we ask that you use the ramp. Please refer to the bulletin or Faith, Faith's Facebook page for all upcoming activities at Faith. The porch is our weekly Bible discussion where Reverend Larry and others discuss next Sunday's discussion. Bring a tea, a coffee, or soda, and join us for this hybrid meeting. This week's passage is Acts chapter 11, 1 through 18. And I see Beth. Good morning, everyone. I guess I'm the only one with an announcement. But that's okay. It's a really good announcement. It's a reminder about next Sunday's Super Sunday. And just to entice everyone, we're having butternut squash soup with pear, chicken barley soup, 
pea soup, and kakaliki soup. And the smells will be wafting through the building as you enter. In addition, of course, to that, we're having homemade biscuits. Now, who can pass that up? Also, the Sundays that you get to make on your own will have chocolate, strawberry, caramel, and of course, whipped cream with nuts and a cherry on top if you so desire. The tickets are only $10, and they include entertainment from Happy Harmony Choir at 1.30. So you get a whole afternoon of entertainment for the bargain price of $10. You can't beat it. So next Sunday, April 21st, and it'll start sometime after service once we get everything set up. And I have the tickets today. And I also have Scott Wood tickets, if anyone's interested. Thank you. I guess that no one else has an announcement. So please join me in saying our offering prayer together. Life-giving God, our very being is transformed this Easter. We have encountered the living Christ. It is in gratitude that we express our faith, offered in sharing our resources, and it is in joy that we offer ourselves as we affirm our commitment to love, love, love. Bless, O God, all these our offerings. Amen. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near, and I will fear no evil. For my God is with me, and if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear, whom then shall I fear? No, no, you never let go through the calm, through the storm, oh. Never let go of me. And I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. A glorious light beyond all compare. And there will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes. You here on the earth, and I will fear no evil, for my God is with me, and if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? No, no, you never let go Through the calm and through the storm Oh, no, you never let go In every high and every low Oh, no, you never let go Lord, you never let go of me Oh, no, you never let go no, no, you never let go Through the calm and through the storm Oh, no, you never let go Every high, every low Oh, no, you never let go Lord, never let go of me I can see a light And I can see 
a light that is coming from the heart that holds on. There will be an end to these troubles until that day comes. Still I will praise you. Still I will praise you. see a light that is coming from the heart that holds on and there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes still I will praise you still I will praise you oh no you never let go and through the storm oh no you never let go through every high and every low oh no you never let go Lord never let go of me no no you never let go through the calm and through the storm oh no you never let Never let go of me, Lord. You never let go of me. Amen. My friends, go forth knowing who you are and whose you are. For the love of God is yours to share, the peace of Christ is yours to extend, and the power of the Holy Spirit is yours to offer. Know that you are blessed with God's grace. Know that you are blessed with God's peace. Know that you are blessed with God's presence as you journey ever deeper into the way of Jesus. Amen. We're going to play that chorus again and make your way out. Glad you were here to worship with us today. Thank you.